16 years ago, there was a knock on my uncle's door. It was still early in the morning, um, and he was still in bed together with his seven-month pregnant wife and his two-year-old sleeping peacefully next to him. He goes off to get the door, but comes back pretty quickly to tell his wife that he's going to be home later that afternoon. 16 years later, my uncle has still not come home. My name is Vanessa Berhe. I am an Eritrean Swedish human rights activist, born and raised in Stockholm, currently studying law in London. Since 2013, I've been advocating on behalf of my uncle, who's a journalist who's been in prison in Eritrea since 2001. I'm here today to speak about how the imprisonment of my uncle and his colleagues led to fundamental changes in the country, not only torn apart families, but completely turned the country into a dictatorship. I will talk about how it's difficult to talk, talk about um, STGs in Eritrea and what strategies I think are needed to divert these difficulties about implementing these goals in a country that lack um, fundamental um, infrastructure and institutions. I will then update you a little about the project that I talked about last year that is kind of included in these solutions um, that I'll present here today. So I, I've always found it hard to discuss both the previous modern development goals and the newer sustainable development goals in the context of Eritrea. Because uh, many of the factors that allow these goals not only to succeed, but even to begin to be worked upon, are non-existent in Eritrea. These factors include a functioning government, a parliament, a judiciary, a civil society, universities, and the fundamental freedom to express yourself. All the involvement of the SDGs in Eritrea and the extent of this involvement is solely decided by the government. And because all this work is only done by this small group of people, it is inherently um, lacking and limited. And when my uncle was imprisoned, um, he was not alone. It was a week after 9-11, and the government decided to shut down all free press, um, shut down the parliament, and imprison politicians and journalists who had expressed um, critiques against the government. And when they did so, Eritrea became a dictatorship. Not a single one of these people have been uh, released, granted a trial, or even a visit. And we've already discussed the great dangers of suppressing press freedom, regardless if it's in a democracy or a dictatorship. The dangers of camouflaging um, your biased opinions as facts. And Eritrea is a clear and extreme um, example of these dangers. Eritrea is one of the few countries without any parliament, any implemented constitution. Um, few countries in the world and the only country in Africa that does not have a single independent media platform, neither TV, um, newspaper, or radio. There's no civic society, neither foreign or national, at all in the whole country. None of these initiatives that we're discussing here are even discussed in the country because there is no sphere, there's no platform. And by killing all these opposition um, of ideas, critiques from journalists and politicians, the government does not have any opposition to the work that they're doing in the country. And this means that they can implement policies and ideas that um, affect the people in a negative way, but because there's no opposition from them, they can continue doing so. And this is leading uh, a lot of people to leave the country. Over 5,000 people are leaving every month. One, some of these policies include shutting down the only university in the entire country. Asmara University, um, the capital, was the only university. And in 2002, they decided to shut it down. Um, today, they have a few technical colleges where the government themselves decide what program they are going to study. And these are only a limited amount of people ha who have access to these technical colleges, and the rest are forced to be a part of an indefinite national service program that Patrick mentioned briefly, where people have to work almost for free for a government for an indefinite amount of time. And because of this, um, over 5,000 people are fleeing. So if you look at the situation in the country, it is not a place where ideas can flourish and um, academics can discuss and politicians can argue. It is a place where it's one person decides everything, um, and therefore progress is not being seen, and therefore people are fleeing. Um, but this does not mean that a sustainable future is not possible for Eritrea, and this is where the solution-based uh, uh, part of this pr uh, presentation comes in. It is a complex issue. Uh, it's a question of nation building, of institution bu building, and capacity building. Um, and this is a very short presentation, so I'm going to talk about what I think mainly needs to be done in the country um, and how I think everyone here can be involved. So the first part is the advocacy part. Um, that is what I've been doing for the past four years, advocating on behalf of my uncle, um, on behalf of the people in Eritrea that are suffering these human rights abuses. Um, Eritrea is a very small country. Um, 3.5 million people live there. Um, more people are based in diaspora, but we're still a very small country. A lot of people do not know that this country even exists. So. 
uh, we're doing everything we can, um, Eritreans, I have a lot of Eritrean friends, trying to share uh, our people's story to make sure that people know what's happening um, in our country so we can put pressure on the Eritrean government to you know, release these prisoners and implement these policies that will support the people, not oppress them. Um, but this requires involvement of a lot of people um, for a government to listen. It's easy to speak up, but it's hard for um, the government to actually listen to what we're saying and change their ways. Um, and this is where I invite every single one of you to join me. Um, when I came here for the first time uh, f uh, four symposiums ago, so three years ago, I spoke about uh, human trafficking for Eritrean refugees, but every single person in that room who were here have helped me ever since um, by raising awareness at your campuses, in your communities. Um, with our organization, we have an ambassador program where you can raise awareness wherever you are, whatever platform you have. Um, use your voice, use your platform to speak up for people um, who literally have no say and no voice in their country. Um, so that's the advocacy part. Um, and it is necessary because through this advocacy, we can create an environment where Eritreans themselves can discuss, progress, and you know, create a better sustainable future for ourselves and you know, for themselves. But this is a long process. Um, my uncle's been in prison for 16 years. The country has been a dictatorship for more than 25 years. And we can't wait to work on these goals um, for the government to fall or for the government to be changed. We need to start now. Um, so that's the second part of the plan, is to work with the people who are fleeing. Um, because the people who are fleeing Eritrea are fleeing because there is no future in Eritrea. They don't have the education there. They don't have the platform or the tools necessary there to create a sustainable future, neither for themselves, for their families, or for the country which means that when they come here, we need to do our best to make sure that they have the tools necessary to reach their full potential um, and become you know, the people that they uh, wanna be and the people that they think they can contribute the most to their, their own societies, their own lives, and their own country. Um, and this is a project that I spoke about last year, um, the REM project, uh, Rehabilitation and Integration of Eritrean Migrants, um, where we invest in Eritrean refugees uh, and make sure that they're not a lost generation. Because 5,000 people every month from a country of 3.5 million people is a lot of people. Um, and a lot of them, most of them are youth. Um, a lot of them suffer trauma on their way from Eritrea, wherever they wanna flee, through Sudan, Ethiopia, Libya, Egypt. A lot of them are tortured, kidnapped, um, raped. And these issues are not properly dealt with in our communities and therefore needs to be dealt with. So this project aims to First of all, we rehab rehabilitate these refugees, and second of all, integrate them in their, into their new societies, make sure that they um, don't fall into this trap of low skill and low paid jobs instantly to just provide for them, for their families and their families back in Eritrea, but to you know, fulfill their potential. Um, go to university, education, education, education is the key, um, but it's not the key maybe for everyone. So if someone wants to be an artist or a musician or a painter, they should be able to reach their dreams and reach their full potentials. And that's what this project aims to do. Um, and we're still forming it, we're still working on it, working with um, mostly Eritreans ourselves who are, uh, some of them are doing their PhD on the mental health effects of refugees, for example, looking at what kind of programs will be able to sh uh, help these people the best. Um, and at the same time, looking at how do you properly integrate um, refugees. We're not the only country that have, has refugees. Uh, in, people are gonna come after us, people have been before us. So we need to learn from each other and support each other um, in that quest. Let's see. And that's kind of what that project is going right now. Still researching, still making sure that we can have the best program possible um, to uh, help these people in you know, the best way. Because I was speaking um, to Dr. Ala before about this and she said the dangers of, for example, having a program that isn't complete from the beginning might deter people from coming back. So it is necessary to do the, the complete research before, learn from other people, um, and kind of start slowly, start with a community-based uh, group where people can meet, connect, um, and then slowly get into the whole rehabilitation process. Because it's not easy to say that, oh, you have a problem and we're gonna fix it for you. It needs to come um, from yourself too. So that's what we're doing with that project. And the first part is the advocacy part, uh, putting pressure, raising awareness. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at right now. And I invite um, every single one of you, um, and I understand that 16 years might sound like a long time, and that change is not possible, but I assure you that no uh, dictatorship lasts forever. It's never been and it will never be. 
Um, and I just came from a conference where a German uh, guy spoke about uh, his situation where Hitler was in power and how a person, was, um, an officer was trying to build a plan to assassinate him. And he said that the fertility of our efforts um, should not stop us, but it is the fact that we're trying and the lack of trying um, would be the fall um, of our morality. So we should keep trying until the day that these people have the future and the presence that they deserve. So thank you very much.